Welcome in to Daily Faceoff Live, your go-to source for everything hockey, live every weekday at noon Eastern. What's up, everybody? Welcome into a Friday, January 6th edition of Daily Faceoff Live. He is dailyfaceoff.com managing editor and senior writer, Matt Larkin. Matt, how you doing, buddy? I'm good, Frank. It's good to see your face, the way the cookies crumbled. We haven't been on together for a while, so it's good to be reunited, my friend. Yeah, we've got tons to talk about, Matt, so let's throw two minutes and 30 seconds up on the clock, and let's drop the puck with that phenomenal gold medal game that ends in overtime. Of course, Dylan Gunther with the win for Team Canada as they celebrate as back-to-back World Junior gold medal champions for the first time since they did it in 2008 and 2009, they actually won five in a row that culminated in 2009. And a special night in Halifax caps off a ridiculously compelling tournament, Matt. It was unbelievable. And I can't remember the last time a World Junior has lived up to the hype this much on so many different levels. If you're looking at Canada just in general, of course, the Connor Bedard machine was unbelievable, unstoppable in the semifinal, his overtime winner. I think that's going to be an iconic moment now with Jonathan Taves and Jordan Eberle. Just the upsets in this tournament, Slovakia beating USA, the Czechs beating Canada earlier in the tournament. So many great individual performances. And I do think this is one of the most stacked Canadian teams going into the tournament. And it really just lived up to the hype. I'm, I'm pretty impressed at the entertainment value of this tournament. Yeah, there was no shortage of that. And Team Canada also dealt with a little bit of adversity, losing to Czechia in the first preliminary round game to open the tournament. They get their revenge in the gold medal game, of course, after almost blowing a 2-0 lead. Uh, The Czechs forced overtime with a pretty sublime performance. They looked like the more comfortable team through large stretches of the most important parts of the game. A critical turnover, of course, in three-on-three overtime is what ends it with the puck on Dylan Gunther's stick. A nice give-and-go play. What do you make of the comments from Connor Bedard that came after the game? He was showed some serious maturity when he said afterwards, look, I'm not talking about myself right now. This is about our team and our win. But for so much of this tournament, to see it be dominated by a 17-year-old draft-eligible player, it's so rare. It puts him in really elite company with really only Wayne Gretzky in terms of the performance in this specific tournament. Uh, what do you make of his comments? Would I'd, I'd love to see some personality there. It's true. I do think, you know, we saw it with Connor McDavid around the same age as Sidney Crosby as well. When you're hyped this much, when you're being followed around literally from age 12, that's how early we were talking about Connor Bedard. I think you sort of have to program yourself to to deflect and draw a little bit of attention away from yourself because the attention's always on you at all times. I think it's almost a survival tactic to be just a little bit boring. And I do think in this case, it's a sign of leadership. It's a sign of a mature player who's already thinking in his hockey cliches. He's already a team player in his mind. And I think that just shows he's pretty NHL ready. We can expect wherever he goes, he's going to be looked to for a leadership role right from the beginning. Yeah, pretty on brand. I saw that being celebrated immediately in industry circles of, hey, way to go, Connor Bedard. He said exactly what he was supposed to. Also, some news to pass along. The Seattle Kraken have loaned number four overall pick Shane Wright back to to Kingston of the OHL. As I reported just a few minutes ago on social media, don't expect right to remain in Kingston for very long. I'm told a trade is expected to materialize in short order. The Barry Colts and Peterborough Peets are expected to be the front runners, although at this point you cannot count out teams like North Bay, London, and Ottawa as well. So look for Shane Wright to be on the move in short order, but a somewhat quiet tournament for Shane Wright before a significant goal in uh, the gold medal game, a sweet backhand as he celebrated his 19th birthday. Hopefully this tournament, even though relatively quiet on the production front, will help boost his confidence as he now gets to be the man again in junior hockey. Matt, uh, that was not the only awesome performance on Thursday evening. UC Saros uh, etched his name into the Nashville Predators record books with a ridiculous 64 save performance against the Carolina Hurricanes. And you look at the way that the shots kept unfolding in this game. I was watching and following along live. I would check and flip back and forth between this game and a few others last night. And I was like, 44 shots in the second period? Am I seeing this right? What is happening here? And UC Soros, the clear difference maker on a night that the Carolina Hurricanes flat out blew the doors off the Preds. 
Unbelievable. Almost tripled them in shots and the little goalie that could UC Saros. One of the best individual performances by a goaltender this century, and I, I'm not exaggerating. If you look at some of the comparison points, you have Ben Scrivens, the 59-save shutout, which was in 2014. That's probably the gold standard. You had you have Yunus Corposalo in the five-overtime game in 2019-20, had 85 saves. You had Igor Shosturkin, who almost had 80 saves in the game last year. But this is the second most saves in a game ever in regulation. The record is Mario Lassard, 65. So Saros was so close. And it just shows how much he's rounding into form. He was someone who was really off. His game was off at the start of the season. He was looked to as a Vezina Trophy contender yet again coming into the season. Didn't quite have his game. When you're a small goalie, when you're off, there are a lot of holes in the net. But he's found it. Obviously, he's one of the best skating goalies in the NHL. And he's just absolutely in a groove. It was an amazing performance to see. What do you make of the Preds and their season, Matt? You know, they certainly have regressed a bit. A lot of people saw this coming based on some of the career years that a number of players had last year. And I'm not just talking about their top end scorers, but Tanner Janot, I think he had 24 goals last year. He's down to three at this point in time this season. Not everyone's been able to march back and put together the same type of season that they had last year. And the Preds are floundering a bit. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in our deadline countdown segment next, specifically with regards to Matthias Ekholm. But where do the Preds go from here? Where would you start? I would like to start by just getting the old Acme TNT thing and blowing it up if I'm David Poyle, because this team is living in the murky middle far too long. Every season, there's this inspiring story of the Nashville Predators. Are they going to make the playoffs? Are they going to make a late push? Will goaltending carry them into the playoffs? Last year, they were a very tough team, probably the most physical team in the NHL, very hard to play against. They had some great stories, like Tanner Janot, perfect example. But so many of the players were over their heads, especially Matt Duchesne, of course, the career year, even Ryan Johansson. A lot of it was not sustainable. And I just think this franchise, it's low on talent. It's doomed to sort of hover in the murky middle. You have some prospects coming in, guys like Phil Tomasino, but you don't have the A-grade, can't-miss superstars. The only way to get there is to be a lot worse. I think it's time to blow it up for David Poyle. So as we transition into talking about Matthias Ekholm, who we'll have featured today in a player profile on dailyfaceoff.com, as I reported earlier this week, he is available. Before asking you about Ekholm, I wanted to ask very quickly, if everything's on the table, should the Preds then consider potentially moving someone like Saros? Absolutely. And I have a segment where I'm going to bring that up a little bit later, but the the contract is very attractive for Saros. I believe it's two years left at $5 million. And we know how important goaltending is. Look at the other goalies on the market, someone like a James Reimer. There are a lot of stopgap type options. But if you're looking at someone who could carry you, who could be a, the Con Smythe trophy winning type of piece, Saros, if he's out there, I think there'd be plenty of teams that are interested, especially because he's that luxury rental. You get a couple seasons of him at a really nice price. Yeah, I would say not a rental. That makes him someone with some serious cost certainty that you can build a team around for the next few years and when you look at his impact not being on the ice last year as they got to the playoffs he made that waste of eight days from Daryl Sutter a reality uh, for the Preds when he wasn't in the lineup but someone that's helped at times make life easier for Saros in front of him has been Matthias Ekholm I would say not really a shutdown defenseman he didn't crack the top 20 in our archetype ranking certainly deserved consideration I think he's in the next rung down as a defensive defenseman although uh, interestingly enough he did end up scoring one of his four goals this season last night against the Carolina Hurricanes what would you be getting in someone in Ekholm who has three years left on his deal? And as I looked through some of the comparables, Matt, uh, maybe even between the Preds and their own recent history in trading Ryan Ellis to the Philadelphia Flyers previously, they didn't get a whole lot in return because of the contract and the term that's remaining on Ekholm's deal. Um, but in a best case scenario, what do you think the Preds would be looking at in terms of a return? I think it would be fair to ask for a pretty significant package because I call him, he might not be in his prime anymore fully, but he's an extremely well-rounded piece. He has that giant wingspan. He's quite mobile for a big guy. He can move the puck for a big guy too. He's not an elite offensive player, but he's not a zero as well. You can also play him against other teams' best players. You can put him in all situations. So factoring in all of that, all of those attributes, I think it's fair to say, I want a first round pick. I want one of your best prospects. You do have to wonder if there has to be some salary retention involved, 6.25 million AAV. You have three more years left. He's going to be 36 when that deals up. A big guy, I don't know how well he's going to age. So I don't think it's the easiest transaction to make, 
but I think it's a very valuable piece, especially in the short term. I looked at that contract. It's not buyout proof. So if you're a contender, you can sort of think in the present and you can worry about what happens later, even if he starts to age at the end of that contract. A couple points on that, Matt. One, it's really hard to get teams to retain with that many years remaining. They don't want something like that on their book. So I'd be surprised if Nashville ends up going down that path. Mm -hmm. And the other thing too is he's been really durable. And that's been one of the big boons for Matthias Ekholm in his career. For a big guy that does play a lot of minutes, he's not really overly physical. And I think that's probably helped him uh, stay in the lineup as well in terms of conservation and and, uh, efficiency. And I kind of view him as a player that is a bit better than Jake Muzzin, but of the same stylistic fit, if that makes any sense. If you're a Toronto Maple Leaf fan or know Muzzin's game well, it doesn't have necessarily the championship pedigree, but certainly could help your team get to that type of stage. So we'll have more on Matthias Ekholm in our trade deadline countdown player profile later today on dailyfaceoff.com. So check that out. And Matt, that brings us to our weekly buy a beer segment. Who are you buying a beer for this week? Oh, Frank, I don't know if a beer is going to do it justice. I think it's maybe three fingers of bourbon or something for Kyle Dubas, seeing what's happening to his goal. Wow. Maybe. I think you need something stiff because I think you're getting some PTSD if you're the Leafs right now. You're remembering Jack Campbell a year ago. People were talking him up. Mm. Vezina Trophy candidate. He had a save percentage of 945 or something by American Thanksgiving. The wheels fell off, as we all remember. Now, with Matt Murray and Ilya Samsonov combined, they are slumping at the same time. Ilya Samsonov, four games in a row below a 900 save percentage. You have Matt Murray, four out of his past six. Maybe his worst game in a Leaf sweater last night. He sort of lost his composure in that one. Four goals in, on 12 shots in one period. So I'm wondering if that Cinderella story is turning back into a pumpkin. Do you have to start looking ahead at a possible replacement at the trade deadline if this tandem's not getting it done? Yeah, I think it's a great question to ask. I mean, remember at this exact time last year, I, I looked up the stats. This day last year, you woke up, if you're a Toronto Maple Leaf fan, and Jack Campbell had a 939 save percentage on his season, and we were talking about him as the bona fide Vezina front runner at this point in the season. It's next week last year that things really began to fall apart for Jack Campbell. Never has really recovered. Not just, he played an okay playoff series, still in the 800s against the Lightning, but with the Edmonton Oilers, still has not recovered and found his game again and certainly needs to continue to work in that department. So you're hoisting a pint for Kyle Dubas and the Maple Leafs, or perhaps more than a pint. Uh, I do like the three fingers of bourbon. I'm a, a big bourbon guy myself. And I'm going to buy a beer for some first responders and medical team personnel. We all remember the story earlier this week, obviously, on a more serious note, Damar Hamlin from the Buffalo Bills and the significant injury that he sustained uh, just now being taken off of uh, the breathing tube, which the Bills reported earlier today, has been removed and has retained his neurological function, which is absolutely incredible uh, for what he went through basically uh, full cardiac arrest on the field in an NFL game on Monday Night Football. I said on social media earlier today, the absolute best place that this could happen for DeMar Hamlin if something unthinkable like that is to happen based on who's available and who's around. And we're really fortunate also in the hockey world. There was another thing earlier uh, this week that popped up between uh, Army and an inadvertent skate cut uh, that went to the neck of one of their players first responders able to respond quickly. So buying a pint and a beer, uh, a beer for all of our uh, medical teams and first responders, you know, coaching youth hockey, this is one of my biggest fears continually at the rink is we don't have any of the same resources that are available. And so you always think worst case scenario and uh, so much to be thankful for across the sports world for all those who keep an eye out for all of us, not just in sports. I couldn't agree more, Frank. And I'm just astounded at how it played out in that horrifying scene of Monday Night Football. Uh, Just the, you know, we're not doctors, but what we understand, but if you go into cardiac arrest, the odds of survival for Hamlin seem to be very low, especially with brain function. I'm absolutely blown away that they're able to save him. An incredible story. And I wouldn't want to play the Buffalo Bills going forward. That's a team that's going to have a lot of emotional motivation now. Yeah, Tyler Remchuk, our resident Bills fan. Bills by a million this weekend against the New England Patriots as DeMar Hamlin was FaceTiming his teammates and his team today. Had to be some pretty amazing stuff. Let's get to some fantasy talk with our guy, Nick Alberga.
That's right. Pleased to welcome back to Daily Faceoff Live our guy Nick Alberga from Leafs Morning Take, part of the Nation Network, for some fantasy talk that's delivered by Montana's. So, Nick, uh, we had some big news earlier this week. Jacob Verana cleared waivers, a surprise to some from the Detroit Red Wings. If you're a fantasy hockey owner, you would know that having Verana, uh, one of the league leaders in goals scored per 60 minutes when he's been out there, with him clearing waivers from a fantasy perspective, how should owners handle him? Yeah, Frank, that's pulling on my heartstrings right now because you look at the body of work of Jacob Verona in Detroit, it's incredible. 39 career games, 22 goals. You look at that pace, my goodness. Uh, having said that, to answer your question, I think at this point in time, it's an easy drop. Um, you know, First and foremost, you look at his lack of production so far through four outings in the American Hockey League. Small sample size, minus six, no points. But I think it's quite clear Detroit doesn't feel he is ready to play at the NHL level right now. And on top of that, He's missed a lot of time and coming back from something really, really heavy. So um, I think I'm in a situation right now where I'm not waiting around anymore. It's an easy dropout, I think, for Jacob Vrana right now. Nick, uh, so with Vrana, he's coming back from something that's off the ice in terms of adversity, but someone yeah. who endured some adversity that relates to his on-the-ice performance is Max Pacioretty coming off a very serious Achilles injury, comes back a little ahead of schedule. We know he's still an elite player, almost elite in fantasy, lots of shots, 88 points in his last 87 games over the previous two seasons, but he's 34 years old. That's a really serious injury. I know he comes back, gets six shots in his first game, but are you expecting any kind of rust, and is he a risky own right now in fantasy? I think it's fair to expect a bit of rust. Having said that, I think, you know, there's just so much value in a guy like Max Pacioretty. You even look, you know, just before I hopped on at 60% ownership in standard Yahoo leagues, which I think should be around 80%. Like, I think you look at the body of work, you look at what he's done throughout his career, leads me to believe he's going to produce in Carolina too. Like, I understand where you're coming from. Ultimately, to me, the biggest concern would be the deployment. Um, I think he goes from a Vegas team that was very top heavy, at least in the top six, to a Carolina team that can roll one through four at you. Very similar to St. Louis when they won the Stanley Cup, in my opinion. So he starts last night with Kotkaniemi and Stepan in the quote-unquote fourth line. PP2 as well. No points. Plays 1606. Six shots on goal, as you referenced. So the, the shots are still there, I think, clearly early on. Uh, but I'm, I'm certainly at the very least taking a flyer on Max Pacioretty. I do think he is must-own right now in fantasy hockey. And it's more so because of the resume. But I know what you're saying about the injury concern. Yeah, and Pacioretty was just a beast, as you can look at his numbers here in Vegas. Some injuries along the way, Nick, but that's a 37-goal pace if you calculate it out over an 82-game season. So uh, we'll see what Pacioretty can do. Had some good chances as well uh, in his first game with the Carolina Hurricanes against Nashville on Thursday night. One guy that's also out due to injury is Jake DeBrusque, reported earlier this week. Fractured fibula, going to keep him on the shelf for approximately the next four weeks with him out. Who would you be targeting? DeBrusque, it's such a shame for him who was having the best season of his career. That's exactly it. Such a shame. I mean, he has been on fire five goals in the last six games. I still can't believe he played the Winter Classic, scored two goals, and then they announced the injury, but so be it. Um, I think, honestly, this is tough news for, like, Krejci and, and Taylor Hall owners because the perfection line is back together. And, and Boston, to me, guys, has been the biggest story from a team perspective in the fantasy season. I, for one, did not expect them to be this good. They've been incredible. Swayman gets the victory last night. They, they mount another co comeback victory at state or uh, at crypto against the Los Angeles Kings. But the perfection line is back in the mix. They're back together. Um, so I wonder how long they run with that. It makes the most sense in my opinion. So I think your best, you know, your best bet is to look externally for replacement options. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Max Pacioretty, uh, Michael Bunting, nine goals in the last 11 games playing with, with Austin Matthews there and Willie Nylander, Scott Lawton, pride of Oakville, Ontario, five game point streak, three goals, seven points couple LA Kings I would look at too, Victor Arvidsson, Alex Iafalo, Alex Kalorn with Tampa in a contract year, and Brandon Hagel. You guys just talked about the trade deadline. I just wonder who Tampa is going to steal this year, guys. Yeah, it's interesting. I was watching the Flyers game the other day, Nick, and I saw Scott Lawton getting some PP1 time. So I thought that was uh, certainly interesting as well. Thanks to Nick for all your fantasy hockey talk insight. Uh, you can catch him on Leafs Morning Take Monday to Friday as part of the Nation Network. Follow along on YouTube and subscribe as well. Fantasy Hockey Talk this week was brought to you by Montana's This Sports Season. Bring back the viewing party at Montana's with their brand new daily deals. There's something good every day. My favorite is 
is the all you can eat ribs on Tuesdays. Uh, head over to montanas.ca for more info for their daily deals. There's some drink deals as well. Check it out at montanas.ca. All right, Matt, time for our daily face-off inbox question of the day. Hashtag ask DFO. Hit us up on Twitter. We'd be happy to answer yours. And my question for you is, as we run through uh, a lot of the all-star game selections, the first 32 named by the NHL's hockey operations department on Thursday evening. I can't believe this isn't being talked about more. But if you had gone into the season, Matt, and Austin Matthews was not one of the first 32 players named or one of the eight players named from the Atlantic Division, I think everyone would be absolutely stunned, but on pace for a 40-goal season, a big drop-off from the 60-plus that he scored last year. How surprised would you have been when the season started, and what does this say about his season in terms of how it's been viewed, at least by the Hockey Operations Department? Yeah, it's a fair question. I don't think we could have anticipated Tage Thompson just becoming a god among men. I think that's a big reason why if you look at the Atlantic roster. But at the same time, if Austin Matthews was just Austin Matthews, the numbers would be there, the pace would be around 60 goals, and we wouldn't even be talking about this. So it's a fair question. I think the thing with Matthews is people underestimate how complete he is as a player. I don't think he's having a bad year. He's on pace for only, what is it, 95 points, 97 points. He's playing elite defense at both ends of the ice. It's why I gave him my first place Hart Trophy vote last year. He's a very complete player. So I still think he's one of the best in the world. If you look at the advanced metrics, the expected goal stats, he's still right there. He's actually been a little bit unlucky. So I am fully expecting a massive tear from Austin Matthews in the second half. That said, it's surprising to see him be a snub. I just hate this format where you have to have a representative from every team. You get guys like Nick Suzuki in there instead of Austin Matthews. Yeah, I mean, I at least get the representatives of every team. This is a weekend. Uh, first off, as John Tortorella said so eloquently on Thursday evening, he doesn't give a bleep about. Uh, but more than that, a lot of sponsor integration teams are sending lots of people from their own individual markets, uh, employees, sponsors, partners, all different types of people on a little trip to South Florida. And they'd like to at least see one player from their team. I get it. You got to represent all 32 and I'm on board with it. But I don't like expected goals, first off, do not count as real goals. And I get that Austin Matthews has been a complete player, but come on, this has been one of the most disappointing seasons that we've had a player have, I think, in a while. And until those expected goals turn into real goals, well, then I don't know why it's not being talked about more. And I know the Leafs are winning, and I know that they had their best season in franchise history last year, and they could potentially do better than that this year in the regular season it's still a little bit surprising that it isn't that big of a topic. So that brings us to daily face-off in our points bet daily bet segment. Tyler Uremchuk, please tell me you've turned this week around. All right, we're just going to jump into tonight's plays, courtesy of our friends at Points Bet Canada. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting slate tonight, and I have a couple of picks. Well, we're getting right into them. I like this matchup. Uh, I'll start with the one at the top, Islanders Flames. Islanders second to back-to-backs here, and I'm actually going with a shot prop. Michael Backlund, the line is set at two and a half, and it's paying minus 110. Let me read to you how many shots he's put up in recent games. Eight, five, two, four, four, three, six. He's been hitting it a lot, is my point, and smashing it in a couple of those games. So I love going Backlund over two and a half shots tonight. And in that matchup on the bottom there, I am hammering the over six goals. Both these teams have been hitting the over a ton recently. Four in a row for each of them, and I like it to go to five. They're each playing on back-to-backs, and we saw how many shots, like you guys talked about earlier, we saw how many shots that the Nashville Predators gave up yesterday. They don't look good defensively right now, and the Capitals have been given up a ton too, so no Kemper or Soros expected since they are in the second of back-to-backs. I think we're going to see this total go well over six goals, and I love that it's six, not six and a half as well, so it does give you a bit of a safety net in terms of a potential push as well, so those are my two plays, Frank. Tyler, you need a safety net these days. We're going to have to call in the reliever. We're going to need a guest picker next week if you don't turn it around. No (laughs) threats, uh, just promises here at Daily Faceoff Live. Good job, Tyler. We'll talk to you next week on the Daily Bets front. And, Matt, that brings us to garbage time. Man, typically I would cede the floor to you, but I wanted to just follow up on our World Junior conversation earlier, and I talked about how I – You know, before the tournament started, I wasn't jazzed up about it for a number of different reasons, mainly due to all that's gone on with Hockey Canada over the last year plus. Um, And I think 
it was just a little bit cringy to hear Luke Tardif, the IHF president, after the game ended and after handing out the gold medals, say at some point that he felt like returning to Halifax and Moncton in the small arenas with rabid fan support was, quote, just the medicine that Hockey Canada needed. And I would say that, yikes, that's my answer to that. Because, look, as great as the World Juniors was in terms of the entertainment value, the hockey was tremendous. It was amazing to see Connor Bedard on such a great stage. No amount of good hockey is going to paper over the ugly stuff that's been happening behind the scenes with Hockey Canada for far too long. Uh, I thought it was very noticeable to me the lack of corporate support that was in place for this tournament and for Hockey Canada uh, from something as simple as the board advertisements. No corporation has been willing to lend their name or their logo to it. It was all ads for Hockey Nova Scotia or TSO, which is an IAHF partner, or Tourism Halifax. All those different things had popped up on the boards. It'd be lined with huge companies in years past. And it speaks to how much work Hockey Canada has to do to continue to rebuild its name. I don't think it's right to slag the players that are involved in the tournament. They've done nothing wrong. Uh, they're kids and teenagers that have a lot to play for and certainly did their country proud. But one tournament as well as it went in the Maritimes, which are always hospitable, to think that that's going to cover over uh, all that's happened behind the scenes. It's just, it speaks to, I think, the poor thinking of uh, the Federation involved as well. I'm with you 100%. And honestly, I found that comment from Tardif insulting. It's insulting to our intelligence to imply that a really fun, happy hockey tournament can paper over, like you said, some horrible atrocities that were committed. And it's almost saying this is the best medicine for us. For the old boys club, this makes us feel better because it's a nice distraction from all the problems of the past. And to me, the actual best medicine medicine is contrition. It's accountability. It's not sweeping horrible behaviors under the rug. And it's, it's healing as a governing body. I know it's not just IHF, it's Hockey Canada specifically, but that would be the actual medicine, not just watching Canada play well. It's, it's very disgusting in my opinion. Yeah, and more to come on this story because it's not anywhere near complete as the London Police Service is continuing to conduct its own investigation into the 2018 uh, World Junior Team sexual assault case, which is active NHL potential discipline and suspensions looming. And the Halifax Police Service continues to look into their 2003 World Junior incident alleged as well. So uh, certainly more to come there as 2023 rolls on. Matt, uh, great job today on Daily Faceoff Live. That'll do it for today's edition. Keep it locked on dailyfaceoff.com for all the latest news, insight, and analysis from around the NHL. We've got that deadline countdown series continuing now and each of the 57 days leading up to March 3rd. Check it out. Until then, we'll talk to you on Monday, 12 noon Eastern. You know where to find us. Have a great weekend. Thanks for tuning in to Daily Face Off Live. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to never miss an episode. 